Hello. In the video lesson number 9b, I will discuss the reveal preference approaches to environmental valuation. So as discussed in the, in the previous lesson, uh, there are of course many purposes to why monetary valuation of the environmental services or environmental impacts is, is uh, needed. And the idea of the reveal preference approaches is to rely directly on the observed behavior or observed choices of individuals or firms. And this is, of course, uh, traditionally has been the preferred approach by economists, uh, because then uh, this kind of observed behavior really uh, can reveal the, the like hidden uh, uh, preferences of individuals, so even if the individuals might not themselves be really fully aware of what they what they actually prefer. So, so this is really based on the observed choices or observed behavior of individuals. So, I will discuss uh, three specific approaches uh, that uh, that are are known and uh, and applied in the literature. So, perhaps the most classic approach is the so-called travel cost method. Uh, uh, the idea of which goes back to Harold Hotelling in the in late 1940s. And uh, this kind of approach could be could be utilized, for example, if the purpose is to uh, value the um, environmental services of a nature reserve, uh, such as, for example, a national park in this example. So again, the example is, is taken from the permanent et al. textbook. And this is just a simplified illustration of, uh, of uh, how the travel cost method could be could be utilized, and uh, this is also perhaps based to to some extent uh, to a survey. So when we later discuss the the um, uh, revealed preference approaches, which are often based on survey, I want to already highlight that of course the uh, uh, revealed preference approaches might also be based on some kind of survey responses, and. Uh, but in this case, suppose that uh, that um, researchers make some kind of survey to the visitors of a, of a national park. Uh, so of course they cannot necessarily observe each and every person coming to the national park. Uh, and uh, it's possible also that even if you if you can approach every visitor, then uh, there might be some some uh, individuals who are not willing to respond at, uh, to these kind of questions. So anyway, suppose that uh, that we have this kind of uh, uh, data from the visitors. Uh, we have somehow recorded that not how many how many visits uh, people make from different uh, different areas. So these zones refer to some kind of uh, areas uh, uh, somewhere uh, adjacent to the to the national park or further away. So so. Uh, there is this kind of simplified table with five different zones and then then uh, we can collect information that how many visits to this uh, national park uh, are made from different different zones we know what is the population of this of these zones and then then we know what is the distance in miles or kilometers from from these these zones of course it doesn't have to be necessarily made by zones it could be even done with, like at the individual visitor level the main thing is that uh, that uh, we know that what kind of kind of distance these uh, visitors have traveled to get to this na national park. Uh, there might be some kind of entrance fee to the national park, uh, which also reveals something. But uh, but also also on top of the entrance fee, these uh, visitors need to of course pay some uh, some um, or bear some kind of travel cost, uh, which might include, for example, some some gasoline consumption, uh, perhaps also some kind of uh, food and accommodation costs to, to visit, the, visit the park. So, so the fact that people are willing to put their own money to, to, to visit some kind of nature national park uh, then indicates that this, uh, these uh, services provided by the, by the national park are, are, uh, are worthy of, of, uh, of something. And the idea of the of the um, travel cost method is to then then based on these kind of distances, which which then involve travel costs, uh, to develop some kind of uh, demand function for this service. So so we would expect, of course, that uh, 
that uh, people living living nearby they have a have a lower travel costs and they tend to visit also more often and then then uh, the people living further away from the national park uh, they they do not visit so often but they have to pay pay a higher higher price in terms of the travel costs to 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 get there so sorting these these individuals or zones uh, um according to these travel costs and and uh, this kind of implicit demand uh, then allows us to to draw this kind of kind of travel uh, sorry uh, draw this kind of demand function so this is just the kind of linear piecewise linear interpolation of this kind of individual uh, observations from different zones or it could be also 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 different individuals perhaps we could use some regression analysis uh, we could do some kind of piecewise linear regression to 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 fit the fit this kind of curve to the to the data and then having this kind of demand curve then we can utilize the ideas of from the from the welfare economics and uh, we could also then uh, then estimate the consumer surplus so that would be just calculating the area that uh, that is under this uh, uh, under this demand curve and there must be some kind of minimum price that uh, that everybody has to has to has to bear to 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 visit the park uh, so so then this kind of area of the of the of this uh, surface uh, under the demand curve would indicate this kind of uh, consumer surplus and the consumer surplus uh, would then at least indicate this kind of direct use value so remember in the previous lesson i talked four categories of environmental benefits so clearly this uh, this kind of travel cost method uh, aims to estimate the direct uh, use value of the of the nature service so obviously this kind of method cannot capture uh, those visitors who did not come to visit uh, but perhaps would, would potentially want to visit uh, in the future point of time and especially this kind of method cannot capture the existence value so so some uh, some uh, individuals might might never visit the nat nature reserve but but would still uh, appreciate that it it exists and, and might be even willing to pay for example for that as a as a taxpayer so then let's consider another approach uh, which is called uh, hedonic pricing and uh, here is an illustrative uh, table also from the from the but textbook um, so very often the hedonic pricing is applied in the context of housing market so uh, the idea is that that we have uh, some kind of regression model to explain the the um, for example the the sales price of a, of a, of a house or apartment uh, it might be it might be in logs for example as in this uh, this example so the idea is that uh, that with the hedonic pricing that we, that we explain the uh, price of an apartment or house uh, based on some some uh, attributes or characteristics of the of the house. So, for example, the the age of the house, or or um, uh, area in square meters, some kind of uh, amenities such as a pool or 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 fireplace. Uh, um, in in this this study, I, I believe in in uh, in Finland it would be more relevant to include a balcony or or a sauna, uh, as as this kind of kind of amenities. Then it can be also besides this kind of apart apartment specific factors, there can be also neighborhood related factors. Uh, here is for example school quality, ethnic composition, crimes, and so on. And finally, in this example, what is most relevant for our course is that, of course, we could also potentially include here some kind of uh, measures of environmental quality in the neighborhood. For example, here are some air pollution variables. Uh, TSP refers to the particle uh, emission. NO, NO2 is uh, nitrogen dioxide. And both are, of course, relevant for the, for the local air quality in the in the in the in the area so uh, this table adapted from a study by brookshire et al in 1982 then 
then has two separate equations for the for the particles and nitrogen dioxide uh, and in both cases uh, it seems that there is some some uh, negative association with the with the housing prices and and air quality of course there might be some issues like like multicollinearity that uh, that could could uh, influence that uh, that kind of uh, and uh, and it does not seem that either of these uh, variables is uh, necessarily statistically significant but the main point here is that uh, that we could utilize this kind of indirect information such as uh, housing prices and impact of the environmental quality on the housing prices to to estimate this kind of how much people are willing to pay for for uh, better local environmental quality so so this is one 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 approach and uh, and perhaps it's also possible to do it in other other contexts than than housing market for example we could have like hedonic equation for the for the uh, for the cars for example that uh, that uh, we could have like uh, emissions of the car as one explanatory variable together with other kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, amenities of the of the car to see that how much uh, people are valuing, uh, for example, low emissions or or even even uh, zero emissions uh, vehicles. So the hedonic pricing is is uh, one approach that is is uh, uh, based on the revealed preference. Then, if we talk about the production context. Then uh, one approach that uh, that I have also worked with uh, in in uh, in recent research is the the so-called shadow pricing using using production function. So this text is from the from the permanent al textbook to illustrate the idea. So think about the, just the usual kind of production function. So so we have output output quantity Q is a function of uh, labor and capital inputs like usually. But then we might have also some some variables. For example, E might be um, some kind of environmental indicator here. It could be also, for example, energy consumption, and and A is then some kind of uh, averting input. So, for example, abatement uh, abatement inputs. And uh, if we manage to estimate the production function, then we also, of course, get this kind of marginal products. It's very standard to estimate marginal products for labor and, and capital, but then we can also have marginal products for the environmental input. It could be, for example, energy input, and we can also have uh, this uh, marginal product of, um, of averting input, uh, so abatement uh, cost. And uh, those now, in this, uh, this slide, it, it, uh, it's indicated that these marginal products are, are positive, but uh, it could be also actually actually negative so there might be actually some trade-off between the good output and the and the, um, and the bad output so the idea of of, uh, of estimating these kind of uh, uh, marginal products or or, uh, or marginal rates of transformation and substitution then then uh, uh, from the production data we get an idea about for example we can we can estimate the marginal abatement costs of, uh, of emissions. And this is something that that is uh, is uh, actually quite uh, quite uh, has has received quite a lot of attention in the in the recent uh, literature on on uh, on uh, for example productivity and uh, and efficiency analysis and uh, I have also contributed to that literature like uh, using the so-called uh, um, convex quantile regression methods. So this is perhaps a growing growing area in the in the in the recent literature compared to these previous two or two approaches. Basically, we, perhaps because also also a lot of these uh, emissions are occurring in the in the production stage. So and and there is also the policymakers have more possibilities to 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 try to abate, for example, carbon dioxide emissions to 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 mitigate climate change. But I don't want to go to the to the technical details in in this lesson further, so so you can read more about that uh, that or, or feel free to contact me if you if you need some some more further references to this kind of literature. So in the next video, then I will I will move to the to the so-called stated preference techniques. Thanks for your attention. See you next time.